The Mighty Mississippi, a WYES electronic field trip in collaboration with the Center for Global Environmental Education at Hamlin University, made possible by our Cornerstone sponsors. The Historic New Orleans Collection, a museum, research center, and publisher dedicated to preserving our area's distinctive history and culture. Details on current exhibitions, books, and programs available at hnoc.org. And by the Arlene and Joseph Miro Charitable Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life in St. Bernard Parish and implementing innovative strategies to creating lasting positive change for the entire community. With additional support from the City of New Orleans and Edward Wisner Donation. It builds from a depth of a wading pool to a deep channel of up to 200 feet as it rolls through the middle of America. It provided spiritual guidance as well as nourishment for Native Americans who settled its shores and traveled its waters. European explorers claimed it, named it, and controlled it. But in the words of Mark Twain, who was raised along its banks, the Mississippi River will always have its own way. No engineering skill can persuade it to do otherwise. Today, we've become more skilled at trying to tame it, but the river always dictates the terms. It's muddy, it's powerful. It's the mighty Mississippi. Welcome to the Miro Foundation's Dockville Farm in Violet, Louisiana, in beautiful St. Bernard Parish. We're located on the banks of the Mississippi River as it nears the end of its more than 2,000 mile journey. From the northern part of the country in the state of Minnesota to the southern tip of the Louisiana Delta before spilling into the Gulf of Mexico. Hi, I'm Tom Gregory. The mighty Mississippi is one of the largest rivers in the world and it's helped build our nation by serving as a major transportation artery. Moving the things that people need to live like wheat and grains coming downriver to fuel for energy that makes its way upriver, keeping the power on and our cars running. During this field trip, you'll be able to send in questions by emailing us at fieldtrips at wyes.org. Plus, we'll also have a few questions for you to answer. You'll first need to text WYES FIELDTRI 069 to 22333, and you'll be set up to send in your answers. You can also respond right on your computer. The Mississippi River has shaped so much of how we live in this country. It's played a big role in our history, in our culture, and in our economy. The muddy Mississippi begins its journey, spilling over rocks at Minnesota's Lake Itasca to form a knee-high, crystal-clear stream that you can walk across. It expands to 11 miles wide while still in Minnesota. By the time it travels more than 2,000 miles past the Louisiana cities of Baton Rouge and New Orleans, it's about a mile and a half wide and is loaded with dirt from the land it drains, reaching a depth of almost 200 feet before its final 100-mile stretch to the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi touches 10 states on its journey. Its watershed, the area drained by the river, and its tributaries cover about 40% of the continental United States. That includes parts of 31 states and two Canadian provinces, making it the third largest watershed in the world. The river was the nurturing force in the lives of Native American tribes, where they created a complex culture and cities populated by as many as 20,000 people. Later, the river became a focus of European explorers, like Spaniard Hernando de Soto, the first European to reach the river in 1541. In 1682, French explorer René Robert Sir de La Salle claimed the Mississippi River Basin for France. Countries competed for control of the river. Then in 1803, France sold a large section of the river's watershed to the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. President Thomas Jefferson recognized how important the river was to expanding the nation. And the river remains a vital natural resource and an essential part of the country's culture and economy. 
It's also an important refuge for wildlife. It attracts 40% of North America's migrating birds and waterfowl, and one quarter of all freshwater species make their home in the river. The Mississippi River Delta, formed near the end of its journey, is one of the world's major delta systems. Over many years, the river has changed shape and direction. Annual river flooding deposited the sediment, or dirt and clay carried in the river, and shaped the delta. But the land which forms Louisiana's coast is now threatened due to erosion caused by storms and saltwater intrusion and subsidence or sinking and the disruption of the sediment deposits due to flood protection projects. There's a lot to learn about the river and our student reporters are going to take you to where it begins all the way down to where it drains into Louisiana swamps before spilling into the Gulf of Mexico. Ellie and Nora will bring us to the headwaters in Minnesota. Kelsey cruises the river in New Orleans, and James ventures into the swamps to get up close and personal with some alligators. Uh -oh. So we have a lot of ground to cover and water to navigate. First, a question for you. French explorers named the river Mississippi. Drawing from various names, Native Americans called it, which meant A, winding water, B, great river, or C, place to sip water. Text your answers to 22333. We'll find out the correct answer after we go to the headwaters at Lake Itasca with Ellie and Nora. Hi, I'm Ellie. And I'm Nora. We are here in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. The two cities are literally across the river from each other. And that's, of course, the Mississippi River. It's often called the Mighty Mississippi because it travels from the northern part of the country here in Minnesota all the way down to the south through Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico. The river begins its flow at about six cubic feet per second and ends up at about 600,000 cubic feet per second by the time it reaches New Orleans, Louisiana, traveling over 2,300 miles. One cubic foot equals about seven and a half gallons. Just think of how many gallons of milk that would be in your refrigerator at home. The length and the volume of the water of the Mississippi River make it one of the largest river systems in the world, impacting shipping and farming and community development along its banks. A lot has been written about the Mississippi, and there's also been a lot of research done on the river. And here in the Twin Cities, there is a place that studies rivers like the Mississippi and celebrates the many ways that they're important to people, society, wildlife, in fact, many of the Earth's essential natural systems. It's called the Center for Global Environmental Education at Hamlin University. Let's head over there to see what more we can learn about the mighty Mississippi. One of the many projects at the center is a multimedia program called Waters to the Sea, which helps students explore how the Mississippi and other rivers interact with humans. We're going to meet up with the center's assistant director and associate professor, John Shepard, to find out more about this amazing river. Hey, you guys, welcome to the center. Hi, John. It's nice to meet you. This all looks really cool. Yeah. Can you tell us more about what goes on at the center? Good question. So we are part of Hamlin University, which is the oldest university in Minnesota. And uh, what we really focus on is helping K-12 students and teachers and members of the general public understand humans and their relationship to nature. For example, we want people to think about and understand the fact that if it rains here in St. Paul on the university or at your house, that rainwater flows untreated into the Mississippi River and it flows downstream in the river. 17 million people rely on that river for their drinking water. So we want people to really understand that. Why is it so important to know about the Mississippi? One of the important things about the Mississippi, one of the things that makes it so amazing is the size of its watershed. What is a watershed? Good question. So you think about a river usually as this ribbon of water, but in fact, it is much more than that. It is the entire landscape everywhere around it that where waters drain into the river. And in the case of the Mississippi, it is huge. So it goes all the way from the Rocky Mountains in the west to the Appalachians in the east. All the rain that falls on that land, the snow that melts in the mountains and stuff, all that flows across the land into tributaries, the Ohio, the Tennessee, the Missouri, into the Mississippi and finds its way to the Gulf of Mexico. It is a huge watershed. So that's one of the things that makes the Mississippi extraordinary. It's also in a, a corridor for wildlife. 
I think of it kind of as the lifeblood of the planet, but it even goes deeper than that. So do you happen to know how much of your body is made up of water? About 60%, right? That's right. You live in the Twin Cities here. In the Twin Cities, we get our drinking water from the Mississippi River. So 60% of you is the Mississippi River. You are the Mississippi River. I like to think about uh, a raindrop that falls at the place where the river starts. Lake Itasca, that raindrop takes 90 days to find its way to the Gulf of Mexico. You know, Lake Itasca, at the headwaters of the river, really isn't very far away. Would you guys be interested in checking that out? Yeah, sure. Road trip! It's around 225 miles from the Twin Cities to the headwaters at Lake Itasca. About a four hour drive. So welcome to Itasca State Park. A little different than where we just were in St. Paul? Yeah. Yeah. This is the second oldest state park of any in the United States. Really a special place. And I'm thinking the best thing we should do to really get a feel for the place is to go to the headwaters. And I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine who's an expert in the history of the place. Here we are. This is the place. And Nora and Ellie, I want you to meet a good friend of mine. Uh, Connie Cox, a senior Hi. naturalist here at Itasca State Park. Hi, Connie. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you guys. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. I'm glad you could be here. So, Connie, how exactly are you able to tell that this is actually where the Mississippi starts? Well, if you look right behind us, it's pretty obvious. Here on the east side of the rocks is Lake Itasca, the north end of the lake itself. The rocks serve as a dividing line, and the water flowing across is the beginning of the Mississippi River. So where these children are swimming and wading, they're in the first few feet of the mighty Mississippi. Wow, and how would you define headwaters? Well, headwaters is the area that where all the water in a basin collects, and from there it begins to flow out into a river channel. So what exactly is the history behind deciding that this is the headwaters of the Mississippi? Well, a lot of people had to come here and find the source because after the Revolutionary War, the Mississippi River served as our nation's boundary, but it only was mapped as far as St. Anthony Falls in lower Minnesota. And so a whole array of explorers came. Finally, in 1832, a man named Henry Rose Schoolcraft was coming to look for the source. He got lucky. On Lake Superior, he met an Ojibwa man named Osawin Dib. They got into a conversation and, and Osawin Dib said, well, that's my hunting area. And so he agreed to lead Henry Rose Schoolcraft here. And on July 13, 1832, Henry Rose Schoolcraft arrived with his Indian guide Osawin Dib and discovered Lake Itasca as the true source. But after Schoolcraft came, other people wanted to take the claim and the credit. <laughs> Finally, in about 1888, the Minnesota Historical Society said enough and they commissioned a man named Jacob Brower to settle the dispute. Jacob Brower came, surveyed the land basin, and said that Schoolcraft was correct in naming this the source. However, after he officially declared it, science caught up with us, and now in the 2000s, people still debate it, and there's even a gentleman who thinks that it starts in South Dakota. However, we go with Henry or Jacob Brower's findings and his survey work that he had done. So where exactly does the water come from up here? 60% of the water that feeds both Lake Itasca behind you and the Mississippi River behind me is water that's seeping up through springs in the lake bed and the river bed. So only 40% is that heavy rain water or snow melt that comes in off the surface of the land. Jacob Brower followed up on that by actually surveying the landscape. He marched around for six months mapping the land and he determined that Yes, Itasca is at the bottom of a basin, and all of that water flows down and collects in that basin on the bottom, and there the river comes out. So it's only the surface flow and volume that constitutes the beginning of a river. And so only here at Lake Itasca on the north end does the surface flow and volume continually flow. And so he determined that the surface flow and volume has to be continual to mark the beginning of a river. And even in the middle of winter, when it is 60 below zero, the water continues to flow. So this truly is the beginning of the Mississippi. Connie, thank you so much for helping us learn so much about Itasca and the headwaters of the Mississippi. 
Well, thank you guys. I'm really glad you can make it out. I hope you enjoy visiting in a park. And by the way, I see those feet are rather dry. <laughs> you need to take your shoes off and wade in the river. And remember, when you're standing in the middle of the channel, make a wish because in 90 days, your wish will come true when the water finally hits the Gulf of Mexico. So John, we've seen how beautiful it is here in Itasca, but how much does the environment change the further downriver we get? That's a good question. You know, when I think about the river, when you look at it the way it is right here, I mean, this is, it's just born here. This is the beginning. It reaches the Gulf of Mexico, the end of its life, and it goes through huge changes. And scientists look at those changes in different ways, and one of the ways they think about that is an idea they call biomes. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. What are biomes? A biome would be like a region of the country that shares uh, natural environments that are in common. So right now, we're sur surrounded primarily by uh, pine trees, beautiful pine trees. This is the coniferous forest biome, and that's where the river starts. As it goes further downstream, uh, it actually goes through an area of prairie. That's another biome. And then uh, downstream of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, the river widens and you get this wide floodplain with all these backwaters and that's a, a different biome. Eventually, it, after many miles uh, flowing through the central part of the country, it reaches the delta and the delta has its own special uh, environmental areas, different biomes. One is a forest, the cypress forest, another evergreen forest of huge ancient trees up to a thousand years old. And then you get into coastal marshes and estuaries and ultimately you get to barrier islands. So the river just, it travels a huge difference and in that journey it goes through tremendous changes. So with all the changes in ecology and biology, how do economic opportunities change downriver? It's a very good question. Uh, one way to think of the river is as a highway. And originally, that's really what it was for Native Americans and for early settlers. Uh, but in those early days, one of the challenges was the current is so strong, it's easy to get a boat to go downstream, but under human power by rowing and stuff like that, really hard to go upstream until the steamboats were invented and the rise of steam engines. So then you had a boat powerful enough it could get upstream. So then things really began to change. So from then to now, the river really is a two-way highway. So we've got stuff that's produced here in the upper Midwest. You know, it's an agricultural region, so we have corn and soybeans and grains and stuff like that. A lot of that, those materials get loaded onto barges, great big barges that float all the way down the Mississippi. And then uh, there's a return of, uh, of goods and services that come back up the other way. So we've got coal, we've got uh, chemicals, we've got oil and gas that come out of the Gulf of Mexico uh, in the Delta region. So it's a, it's a commercial highway, but at the same time, as uh, we've seen here at Lake Itasca, it's also a precious biological resource and ecological resource. So it's kind of all that stuff rolled into one. It's so amazing to actually stand here at the spot where the Mississippi starts its 2300 mile journey. And realize that as the river flows through the center of the country, it gets deeper and faster and wider and very important to the nation and the people who live along the river. Like in the Twin Cities, where we'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks, Ellie and Nora. That was a great start to our trip down the mighty Mississippi, which was the third largest watershed in the world. The Arkansas, Missouri, Ohio, and Tennessee rivers all flow into the Mississippi. And it's really interesting to learn that while the Mississippi is important to shipping and the economy, it's also a source of drinking water for about 17 million people who live along the river, like us here in the greater New Orleans area. Okay. Let's see how you guys did on this first question. Mississippi comes from the names that Native Americans called it, which means Great River. Congratulations to the 88%. And for the 12%, here's another chance for you. We have another question before we join Ellie and Nora in the Twin Cities. Life along the Mississippi River in the 19th century has been featured in two of this country's most admired books, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, and the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. What is the actual name of the author of those books? Is it A, J.K. Rowling, B, Robert Louis Stevenson, C, Samuel Clemens, or D, C.S. Lewis? Remember, you can text your response to 22333 or just click on the answer on your computer. Now, let's join Eleonora back up north.
From its headwaters in the pine forest of Lake Itasca, the Mississippi River flows nearly 500 miles before reaching its first major metropolitan area, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. And as it passes through the Twin Cities, the river goes through more changes than any other stretch along its 2,300-mile course. We're here in Minneapolis at St. Anthony Falls, the only large natural waterfall along the entire river. This is so amazing. What part did the river play in the settlement of the Twin Cities? Well, you could really say that the river gave birth to both cities, but in a different way for each one of them. St. Paul was as far upstream as boats were able to travel, and so that became a port. But there were rapids between St. Paul and where we are here, right next to downtown Minneapolis, that prevented the boats from getting up this far. So Minneapolis was born for a different reason, and that had to do with the waterfall itself that provided water power for early industries. And the falls are amazing, but in, in another way altogether, and it has to do with the geology. So at the end of the last ice age, about 11,000 years ago, this waterfall was about 15 miles downstream where St. Paul is now. And there was a huge amount of water flowing over because of the glaciers were melting at that time. And the waterfall eroded rapidly. And so really the, the waterfall migrated 15 miles in 11,000 years, traveling about 6.8 feet per year to get to this point. And in geologic terms, that is like racing. That is really fast. I'm gonna introduce you to somebody else who's really an expert on the Mississippi River here in the Twin Cities, and uh, we'll get a chance to learn more about all this stuff. So girls, I wanna introduce you to a friend, John Anthonson of the National Park Service, a great guy to talk to, to learn about St. Anthony Falls and the river in the Twin Cities here. So where are we? We are on the Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam. It is the highest lock and dam on the whole Mississippi River, both from the perspective that it's the furthest up the Mississippi, it's also the tallest at about 50 foot left when barges used to come through this. There's locks and dams all the way to St. Louis, 29 in all. And before the locks and dams, the river would go up in, with the floodwaters, but then it would go down and become so low, boats couldn't get up the river. So they had to build a whole series of locks and dams, that, kind of like a stair step that led, lifted the boats all the way up to St. Anthony Falls. At St. Anthony Falls, there's such a steep grade here. It's got to get above St. Anthony Falls, and here we needed locks just to lift boats up over and above the falls. What role did the river play for industries? For Minneapolis, it really gave birth to the city. There are two principal commodities, timber first, and you needed to build your city, and we had lots of timber north on the Mississippi, and you could float it down the river, and they could run the sawmills with the power of the river. Flour milling was really took over here. Started in the 1850s, by 1880, it begins leading the world in production, Minneapolis does. And for the next 50 years, Minneapolis is the top producer of flour in the country and at times the world because of the power of St. Anthony. Are there any invasive species that come along with the Mississippi? You know, the Mississippi River can take a lot of commerce and you boats can come up, but can so can fish. And so there's a, a species called Asian carp. There's four of them, big head, silver, grass, and black. And they take away different parts of our ecosystem and are competing with our native fish. And they are coming up the Mississippi River right now. Yeah, and we're in a national park? Yeah, the whole Mississippi River through the Twin Cities, 72 miles, is a unit of the national park system. So hearing what you're saying, John, just reminds me of how much our relationship with the river has changed here in the Twin Cities. You know, in the early days, the river was just so important for St. Paul and Minneapolis, and then as industry changed and the commercial navigation changed, in some ways we turned our back to the river, and now it's a national park. Now the community is kind of embracing this river again. I just think that is so cool. So thanks for sharing that great story. Thank you both for helping us with everything that we've learned. We've learned so much about this amazing river. We've seen how the Upper Mississippi River has shaped cities, communities, and industries. And as we continue to travel down it, we'll see how it shapes lifestyles and commerce all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. So enjoy your trip down the Mississippi. Thanks again, Ellie and Nora. So far, our trip has taken us to the Twin Cities of Minnesota, but we have more than 1,500 miles to go. As we move down the river, we roll past farming communities in states like Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois. 
The river's watershed brings water from states to the west and east of the river's path. Nutrients and fertilizers for crops are carried into the river and flow all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, which can cause what we call a dead zone in the Gulf, which is an area depleted of oxygen as a result of the fertilizers in the water. This causes problems for sea life in the Gulf. It's a problem that the agriculture industry is trying to solve. Joining me now is Jonathan Foray, director of the South Louisiana Wetlands Discovery Center. Jonathan, welcome. And could you tell me a little bit more about what's going on at the center? Absolutely. So uh, the Wetlands Discovery Center is a nonprofit organization located in Houma, Louisiana. And we work to educate students on how dynamic the system is. Um, and in particular, how all the land that you see around us was created by the Mississippi River. Wait, the Mississippi River has created all of this. All of this, all the land that's underneath us right now. That's right, because um, as the sediment comes down the river, uh, it all gets deposited uh, in these areas. And so all of this is alluvial soil that we're standing on right now. What kind of soil? Alluvial. So alluvial means that it's just been deposited by the river. And how does this get deposited from the river? Sure. So it all starts up north. And so when the snow melts or uh, when it rains, all of the sediments go into the river and then come down the Mississippi. And I mean, the challenge for us now is that we don't get as much sediment as we used to because there's a lot of uh, systems of locks and dams uh, that keep the sediment from getting to us. And then what we have down here are levees. And so the levees prevent the river from flooding and depositing those sediments. And so the sediment pretty much just goes out into the Gulf of Mexico which is a pretty big challenge for so us. So what we have done is design ways of making the Mississippi better for commerce, but in some ways it's actually made it harder for us down here in Louisiana. That's correct, that's correct. Another thing that comes down the mighty Mississippi is things that are causing a dead zone? That's right. And so um, these are the nutrients that are coming from the runoff up north from the fertilizers that are put on the crops there. And so again, when it rains, the snows melt, all of that goes into the, the Mississippi River and then comes down here. And then when it does get out into the Gulf, um, it's, it results in a depletion of oxygen, right? And so there are no things that can live in that dead zone. Um, and so all of the, the fish and the shrimp and whatnot sort of have to figure out a different place to go. That's well, also a challenge for us. We've actually got a question about the dead zone from yeah. one of our viewers. Is the dead zone spreading? If so, what's being done to stop it? So each year we have a different size of a dead zone. And so largely it's about how much fertilizer that's being used up north and how much um, snow melt is taking place and how much rain is taking place there. Because when there's a lot more rain and a lot more fertilizer, all of that comes down the Mississippi and creates a larger dead zone. So a way that we can uh, prevent that from happening is if the, the folks up north growing the crops, um, there's something called cover crops. Cover crops. And so um, they'll put those crops um, on the land that, that are growing all the time so that there's not as much runoff um, of those nutrients in the sediment into the river. So that helps us out to create a smaller dead zone each year. The more we learn, the better it is. That's it. That's Time right. Time to learn some more. We have another question from one of our viewers. Are there any endangered species living in the river? And that's from Lily. Yeah, and there actually are endangered species. Uh, one of the things that we have a challenge with are invasive species. And I'll actually introduce you to another invasive species later on in the program. But the one that we have in the river that is most commonly known is the Asian carp. And these fish are outperforming the native species. They'll get more of the food or they'll even turn the native species into food. And so that makes it a little bit more challenging for them to exist in those areas. So yeah. invasive species making some species endangered. That's correct. That's All correct. right, let's find out how you guys did on your question. Now, uh, of course, and the answer, of course, to the poll question is Samuel Clemens. 60% got it correct. That was Mark Twain's real name. The mighty Mississippi has inspired authors like Twain to write about the way that life has developed along the river's path. Mark Twain drew from his own boyhood experience when he lived in a small town in Missouri along the Mississippi. 
As an adult, one of the jobs he held was as a steamboat pilot. Since Mark Twain's day, engineering projects have been introduced on the river so that big ships and barges can navigate its muddy waters, which is important to the nation's economy. 60% of the nation's grain and 20% of the coal is shipped on the river through Louisiana's ports. Over 500 million tons are moved on the lower Mississippi each year. Steamboats powered by steam engines made it possible to travel upriver and expanded navigation and the movement of cargo on the mighty Mississippi. Today in New Orleans, the steamboat Natchez still rolls up and down the river. Our next reporter, Kelsey, who lives in St. Bernard Parish in Louisiana, takes us on a steamboat ride. Hi, I'm Kelsey, here on the riverfront in the New Orleans French Quarter on board the steamboat Natchez. Ready to steer the Natchez along the mighty Mississippi is Captain Steve Nicolin. So, Captain, tell us about the Steamboat Natchez. Uh, the Steamboat Natchez was built in 1975. It's built just like the, uh, the boats were built in the early 1800s. She's fully steam powered. And that's what gets the paddle wheel going. Yep, that's what gets the paddle wheel going. The steam engines turn a 32-ton um, uh, paddle wheel that's made out of uh, steel and white oak. As a lot of people know, there's only uh, two still left in the United States that's still running the uh, inland rivers. How did steamboat travel change how the river was used? It was actually to help a lot of the farmers. So a lot of these steamboats, with the way they were designed, they were real uh, shallow draft and flat bottom. They can get into a lot of these small river towns and they would pick up a lot of cargo and they can get it to the destination a lot faster. So that right there kind of opened up the trade market and also opened up the uh, Midwest. The steamboat era changed a lot of things for America. So where does the Natchez travel to today? Uh, she leaves the uh, Tulu Street Wharf uh, three times a day. She goes all the way down the Chalmette or around the uh, Chalmette Battlefield where the Battle of New Orleans is fall. Um, we, we turn around then and, and head back up the river. We go through the general anchorage where we actually see a lot of the anchored ships. From that point, they go from there up to the uh, Geno Bridge where the Natchez turns around and on the way back in, you know, she plays the uh, traditional tune on the Calliope and we also give a traditional uh, landing whistles to get her back into the dock. Thank you, Captain Nicolin, for taking us on the Steamboat Natchez journey of the Mississippi. Oh, no problem. My pleasure. Thank you. Steamboats increased river traffic. Towns grew and ports were established to handle the river commerce. The city of St. Louis became a major port in the nation's midsection. It's the northernmost ice-free port on the river. The 29 locks and dams on the Mississippi River end at St. Louis. As the river flowed south, ports developed in cities like Memphis, Tennessee, Vicksburg, and Natchez, Mississippi. Baton Rouge and communities downriver from it in Louisiana, rolling past the city of New Orleans and the port there, onward to the Gulf of Mexico. Again, we hear from Kelsey about the projects that keep the river in business. I'm standing now next to the Mississippi River in New Orleans at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers headquarters for the New Orleans District. We're going to learn about how the river helped the nation grow and what work the Corps of Engineers does on the river. Joining us now is Ricky Boyette with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to tell us more about how we use the river. Hi, Ricky. So, the Mississippi River is so important to shipping and commerce. What does the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers do to make sure that ships and barges can be used on the Mississippi River? You know, the Mississippi River, especially here in South Louisiana, is maybe the most important economic driver for not only this area, but the entire nation. And our job is to make sure that the boats that are passing up and down can do it safe and reliably. But over time, the ships have gotten bigger and we've had to keep up with it. And one of the big things that we have to do is make sure the river stays deep enough and that may seem unusual, given that a lot, of, a lot of the river is 200 feet deep, but there are sections in the river between Baton Rouge and New Orleans and then south of New Orleans that we'll have to dredge out. And what that means is we basically take the river bottom, make it deeper, and then fortunately, we're able to use that sediment for um, land building elsewhere. If there's all this soil and clay and dirt that builds up in the river, does it ever get clogged up? And what does the Corps do to make sure that that doesn't happen? No, it absolutely gets clogged up. Um, so when you're looking at the river, you kind of look at it in seasons, two seasons. We have a high water 
and a low water. Whenever there's a high water, that means we have more water in the river, but it also means we have more sediment. And as that water is moving and that sediment is moving down the river and it gets closer to the Gulf of Mexico, it starts to slow down. And when it slows down, the sediment drops out of the river and into the ground. Unfortunately, it will build up in certain areas. We have to go in and clean all that out. We see a lot of big vessels on the river sometimes. How deep does the water have to be for those vessels to travel? So for South Louisiana, we have what we call a deep draft channel. And today, that is a 45-foot deep channel. That is the minimum we keep it so that the larger vessels can pass through. Interestingly enough, we're gonna bring that down to 50 feet, and that's gonna allow us to pass vessels that usually use like the Panama Canal and these massive vessels to become all the way up to Baton Rouge. So where can those bigger vessels travel and what parts of the river do the smaller vessels travel on? Sure, so with the Southern uh, Mississippi River, um, from the Gulf of Mexico to Baton Rouge, then we have a 45 foot channel. And what that means is that the large, the tankers, the big vessels, the things you think of the big ocean going, they can go all the way up to Baton Rouge. From the Baton Rouge Bridge North, we have what we call a shallow draft channel. And that means that it's at least 12 feet deep. And the vessels that usually use it are your tow boats, your barges, the smaller things that can bring the commerce out of the Midwest. They bring it to Baton Rouge or South. That's when we load it on the big boats and get it out into the rest of the world. And what kind of products are exchanged on the mighty Mississippi? What goes upriver and what comes downriver? The Mississippi River is really the avenue for the Midwest to reach the global economy. So everything from um, your Illinois and Missouri and all of these interstates, they put their commerce, whether it's agricultural, petroleum, coal, you name it, it comes down. But then all the, the items that the, um, the inner part of our country needs to import, they bring up through the Mississippi River. And that's why you'll have four of the largest uh, ports in the, in the country right here on the Mississippi River in South Louisiana. And if you take them combined, they equal the third largest port in the world. Thank you, Mr. Boyette, for teaching us a little bit about the work that's done on the river. As you can see, the Mississippi River really does have a big impact on our everyday lives. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is involved in flood control projects, like the one between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, called the Bonnie Carey Spillway. When the river gets too high, the spillway is open to send some of the high water into Lake Pontchartrain, which is what happened in the spring of 2018. The Corps has also constructed miles of levees along the banks of the river to protect towns and cities from the rising river. Another big job for the Corps? keeping the Mississippi River on course. Over thousands and thousands of years, the Mississippi River has changed its course and built the Louisiana Delta. For the last thousand years, it has flowed largely as we see it today, but it still wants to shift a little bit more to the west. In the 1960s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built a control structure to direct the flow of the river. It's not easy to control the mighty Mississippi. Over many years, it built a delta by leaving behind sediment deposits when it overflowed its banks. But flood protection projects like levees have interfered with the process, causing serious land loss. Louisiana now has a coastal master plan to combat the loss and carry out land building projects. Here in Louisiana at the LSU Center for River Studies in Baton Rouge, Scientists have developed a model of the river to better understand how to plan projects that can capture and use that sediment to rebuild the Louisiana coast. So over the past 80 years, uh, Louisiana has lost over 2,000 square miles of land. Hi, my name is Rudy Semino. I'm an engineer manager with the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. So to help restore our coast, we need projects that help build and sustain the most land possible moving forward over the next 50 years. So the Coastal Master Plan is our blueprint for building, sustaining, and restoring coastal Louisiana. It's a $50 billion plan. Here at the LSU Center for River Studies is the Lower Mississippi River Physical Model. I'm Clint Wilson, director of the LSU Center for River Studies, and I'm running the research program using the Lower Mississippi River Physical Model. The river model was developed in the collaboration with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. It's being used to help the state understand the water flows, the how high or how deep the river is and at different times of the year, and how that will help them plan and design their um, coastal restoration projects. 
The river model represents approximately 200 miles, the lower 200 miles of the Mississippi River. So one year in the Mississippi River can be reproduced on our model in approximately one hour. And that's important for us to be able to understand when a lot of water comes down the river, how high the river gets. In addition to understanding the way the water's flowing down the river, we're really interested in how the sediment moves down the river. And by sediment, I'm talking about clays, silts, sand, mud, all of that's moving down the Mississippi River. The benchmark of the master plan are sediment diversions because they take advantage and they reestablish natural processes using the Mississippi River to put the Mississippi River back to work to rebuild the land that it once built. That's why this model was built, to study and analyze those sediment diversions. So what we're gonna do is actually remove a part of the Mississippi River levee, and then we're gonna place a giant concrete gated structure where that levee was. And then at certain times of year, we're gonna open the gates and flow water and sediment through a, through a man-made canal into the wetlands. Sediment diversions is a, is a very strategic way of reintroducing water and sediment into the wetlands that desperately need it because they're sinking and they're eroding at an alarming pace. And this physical model is one of the tools, one of the science and engineering tools being used to study the reintroduction of Mississippi River water and sediment out into our wetlands. We're back with Jonathan Foray, director of the Wetlands Discovery Center. Jonathan, one of the keys to preventing land, wetlands loss is right here in front of us. That's right. And so um, we had talked a little bit about alluvial soil earlier. And so alluvial soil is sort of, it's a little bit fluffier, if you can imagine, because it's all light and it's being deposited. And that's what the soil is all around here. Now, um, one way that we can restore some of this marshland is if we dredge the Mississippi River and get that sediment and then put it in places where we need it, just like we were mentioning earlier about the sediment diversions. Now, once that land is in place, we have to make sure it stays there. And this is one way that we do that. So these are marsh grasses and, and trees that we plant in order to hold the dirt in now, place. people can plant them. These That's are right. natural for Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, but so these are we native. We can get out there and plant them. Yeah, they're native species. Um, but we have a lot of our students who volunteer with us uh, to actually plant uh, these, these, um, these plants on the newly created land. And this will prevent some of that new soil from washing away once it's either uh, diverted. That's right, that's right, that's right. Um, it's sort of a, the roots sort of act like hands to hold the dirt in place. And so that, that's what's so important about having these around. So this grass is part of the answer to the land loss problem. That's right, that's right. All right, let's get some more answers from you. We have some questions yeah. from some viewers right now. What is the difference between erosion and sinking, Zaira in Indiana. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so, um, because again, we're on alluvial soil, we experience something called subsidence, and that's what we're talking about, the sinking. It's the soil that's sort of compacting. And then with erosion, um, w when we have uh, hurricanes that come in and there's a storm surge, uh, and then chunks of dirt sort of fall off into the water, that's what we talk about erosion. And again, the reason why these plants are so important because if the plants are there with the roots holding the dirt in place, it's less likely for erosion to take place. So you have erosion and you have things sinking. Yeah, subsidence. We've got a lot of challenges here. A lot but of challenges. A lot of smart people who are trying to make sure that uh, we can be successful in, in achieving solutions to those challenges. A lot, of, a lot of questions to be answered and we have one more question. How old is the Mississippi River, and that's from Mali in New Orleans. Another great question, yeah. So the Mississippi River, as far as we can date back, is probably about in the Ice Age, so that's about 10,000 years old. So the Mississippi River has been at work for an awful long time, which is why we have such a beautiful delta uh, that we have here. All right, so now we know the age. Now it's time for you, actually answer a question of ours. In Louisiana and other southern states, we have waterways called bayous, which are small, slow-moving waterways through low-lying low areas or swamps, usually with brackish water. Brackish water, what does it mean? Does it mean A, salty water, B, fresh, or a mix of the two? The Mississippi River is part of our lives here in South Louisiana. It shaped our landscape which includes swamps and wetlands. 
Our next student reporter, James, who is from Terrebonne Parish, joins campers from the Louisiana Wetlands Discovery Center as they venture into the swamp. Captain Billy Gaston with a Cajun Man Swamp Tour. Welcome James and the campers for a trip along Bayou Black into the cypress tree lined swamp. Let's sail a boat en roulette in Cajun French means let the good times roll, huh? Hey! A swamp is a kind of wetland with trees and fresh water and different plants and animals. There are also marshes in South Louisiana. A marsh is like a prairie with different types of grass, but it also has water. Here in Louisiana, marshes are also called coastal wetlands. Let's catch up with James and the swamp campers as they begin the tour. Hi, I'm James and I'm here in Gibson, Louisiana in Terrebonne Parish about to tour the swamps. We're here with the swamp campers from the South Louisiana Wetlands Discovery Center. Let's go see what we'll find. Maybe an alligator or two? Don't charge. Over here. Oh, oh, oh. The swamps, marshes, and wetlands of South Louisiana are important not only to this region, but to the entire nation. Here to tell us more is Susan testero Bajra, the director of the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program. So Susan, can you explain why Louisiana swamps, marshes, and other wetlands are so important? Our wetlands are very important for the rest of the nation. They provide food, so our shellfish, our finfish, our oysters, crabs, all of these things are things that people want to eat. But what lies beneath, beneath all of this land is a great resource of oil and gas. So the nation depends on us for that oil and gas. So how is this ecosystem related to the Mississippi River? This ecosystem was created because of the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is the reason this land exists. You're standing on some of the youngest land in all of North America. So can you tell me what is the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary? The Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary is the land between the Mississippi River and the Atchafalaya. An estuary is a place where fresh water intermixes with salt water. Our coast really is in danger. We lose about a football field of these wetlands every hour, a little bit more than an hour. I don't understand why the wetlands are disappearing. Well, it's a complicated issue. Our first problem is subsidence. The Mississippi River isn't allowed to overflow its banks anymore. So that's another issue. We've also found out that drawing out oil and gas can create pockets of even more unstable land underneath us and can cause more subsidence rates. We have things like the nutra, for example. It can actually pull up marsh grasses. And once the marsh grasses are gone, the land underneath will begin to sink. So we have a variety of causes for our land loss. What happens if we do lose the Louisiana coast? Well, let's start with something you and I like. We won't have oysters. We won't have crabs. We won't have shrimp. We won't have those delicacies that we enjoy. But more importantly, we could lose resources that are necessary for the nation. We have some of the biggest refineries in all of the nation right here. You know, we've lost land equal to the state of Delaware here in Louisiana. That sounds devastating, but what can be done to save it? One of the things we can do is marsh creation. We can actually build new marsh. We can build new land. We can plant certain plants to protect that new land. We can build river diversions that bring fresh water. What can I do and what can we do to help save our wetlands? Well, there are a lot of individual choices that people can make to help save the wetlands. The first one has to do with water quality. All this water that's coming down to Louisiana needs to be as clean as it possibly can be. People who want to be maybe a little bit more engaged can come down. We have volunteer opportunities with our program. One of the things you can do that maybe students don't recognize is you can read and you can learn and you can become more educated so that when people ask you your opinion, you'll have one and you'll know what you think. Thank you so much, Susan. And now with all this knowledge that I've learned today, I can't wait to get started. Great, we're happy to have you involved. Thank you so much. Alligator! This part of South Louisiana is fascinating but fragile. It's depended on the Mississippi River for thousands of years and still does. It may also depend on the unkindness of strangers like the one that Jonathan's got in his hands right now 
Who is this little invasive species? <laughs> so this guy, his name is Beignet, and you're right, he's an invasive species, so he's pretty terrible for our environment because he eats so much of that marsh grass that we were talking about earlier that but not we Beignet. need. Not, but not this guy, he just eats carrots. Just carrots, he's not a meat eater, right? Right, so that's can, correct, yeah, so yeah. you can pet hey, him. He's gonna be <laughs> Hello, my friend. <laughs> yeah, He's yeah. so soft. Yeah, yeah, so um, these guys are invasive. They actually come from South America and they were brought over for the fur trade. Um, years ago, people really wore a lot of fur coats and so their pelts were very important to the economy in the area. Um, but since that stopped, um, there's been a, a, a population explosion of nutria and they really eat up too much of the marsh, so, so they're actually pretty bad, even though this guy's cute. This guy's cute. Yeah. Now some of the other causes for wetlands loss is yep, well, storms. Salt, yep, and yep, and saltwater intrusion. So just the same way that these guys eat up those plants, whenever we have a lot of salt water that comes into the estuary, that can also uh, destroy some of those plants. And like we talked about earlier, the roots, if they're not there to hold the dirt in place, it'll just wash away into the water. So, so we have the land sinking, but we also have water, water rising. Rise. How does right. that affect? Yeah, so, so our lands are, 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 the land is subsiding, so it's sinking and sea levels are rising. And so we experience what's called relative sea level rise. So we in Louisiana actually experience sea, levels, sea level rise at a much higher rate. So if they say the, because of climate change that sea level rises are going two feet, yeah, it's so it's three, a little four. bit, well, it's not, it wouldn't be that, that quite, because we don't subside quite that fast, but um, correct. So we would be experiencing higher levels of sea level um, than the rest of the country would. Another yeah. question that needs to be answered. Yeah, absolutely. We have some more questions that need to be answered. So let's go to the poll. Actually, here's a question. Are there any bull sharks in the Mississippi? That comes from Hudson in Oklahoma. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. We do actually have bull sharks really? in the Mississippi River. Most of them are to the south part of the river, but there have been bull sharks seen as far up as Illinois. Now, it's not common, but they have been seen that far up river. So there could be a bull shark right out and there right now. Don't go swimming, and we're not going to let Benye go swimming either because he might become somebody's meal. <laughs> we got a couple more questions from our viewers. What are some of the ways that we can help the Mississippi River, and that's from Barrett in Indiana. Another great question. Um, so because we use the Mississippi River as a drinking water source, it's really important that we make sure that we don't put any pollutants in it. And that can be as easy as not, not littering, because ultimately you throw something on the ground, it washes into a ditch, it washes into a stream, and then it ends up down here. And so it's really important that we keep all of the litter, all the pollution, and all of the nutrients that we talked about earlier out of the water as well, because we want to have good drinking water. A lot of people have been emailing us about this question. How long would it take to travel down the river? Well, here's the answers. By powerboat, it would take you a few weeks. By kayak, about two and a half months. And the fastest canoe trip took 8 18 days. Wow. 18 days. That guy was... <laughs> guy I was, hope he had some snacks. <laughs> <laughs> More than carrots. More than carrots, for sure. <laughs> the answer to our latest poll question about water in the bayous, it's brackish water, which is a mix of salt and fresh. Congratulations to the 77% that got it correct. And congratulations to everybody. We did it. We traveled more than 2,000 miles in less than an hour and learned about how important the Mississippi River is as an ecosystem and also as a major transportation system. Teachers for hands-on field-based learning experience about the river and the Louisiana coast. Mississippi River Institutes are offered each summer in Minnesota and here in Louisiana by Hamlin University's Center for Global Environment Education and the Muro Foundation. And for anyone who wants to learn more about the mighty Mississippi, be sure to check out the Center's Water to the Sea, Mississippi Adventure Online Learning Program. Go to WYES.org for links to these programs and also to educational resources offered by the Barataria National Estuary Program. And remember, this hour will be archived at WYES.org for viewing anytime. Thanks to Jonathan, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, you cute <laughs> little fur ball. Our little Nutria friend, Ben Yeh. 
And a big thanks for the Mural Foundation for hosting us here at this beautiful location on the Mississippi River at Dockville Farm. And thank you for taking this journey with us down the mighty Mississippi. The Mighty Mississippi, a WYES electronic field trip in collaboration with the Center for Global Environmental Education at Hamlin University, made possible by our Cornerstone sponsors. The Historic New Orleans Collection, a museum, research center, and publisher dedicated to preserving our area's distinctive history and culture. Details on current exhibitions, books, and programs available at hnoc.org and by the Arlene and Joseph Miro Charitable Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life in St. Bernard Parish and implementing innovative strategies to creating lasting positive change for the entire community. With additional support from the City of New Orleans and Edward Wisner donations.